This is Creepy, a podcast dedicated to sharing the most famous, chilling, and disturbing creepy pastas and urban legends in the world. Whether these stories truly happened or are simply fabrications is for you to decide. These stories may contain graphic depictions of violence and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Creepy Presents Urban Legends Part 3 Given the response we've gotten over the last couple of weeks, it's clear that I haven't been doing my job over the last couple of years and providing you with urban legends like promised. But don't worry, I plan to remedy that. And in doing so, there's no point in wasting any more time this week. First up, narrator Heather Thomas is going to tell us about one of the more regionally specific urban legends out there. One that's captivated people not only on the East Coast, but even theatrically. So turn off the ringer on your phone. You don't want to be getting any messages while you hear about the Mothman. In Point Pleasant, West Virginia, there is a myth, as they say. But I call it a legend. Mothman. I am a photographer. I take many pictures of things, mostly people, nature, etc. One day while driving through West Virginia, I saw a bridge. A very large bird thing was on top of it. The thing had bright red eyes, as if it wasn't really even a bird. As I researched it, I found out it was called the Mothman, and many other people had seen it as well. A few weeks went by as I wondered about that strange creature. I saw it in my dreams. Then one night, while I was shooting pictures of a dark and scary place, I heard something that sounded like it was circling around me. Flying. I looked up and... All I could see were red eyes. Scary eyes. I ran to my car. And it followed. As I got back into town... Somebody had a shirt on, with this creature, with those red, scary eyes. I then started wondering if that thing was stalking me, since I had a picture of it, or if it was possibly just wanting something from me. The first picture shows something that somebody found that an Indian had made. So, has this mothman been alive for over a hundred years? Is it even possible that it's a man who had something happen to him? This thing chased me in my car. I was going 75, and it was right on top of me. So this thing can fly as fast as my car, and probably even faster. I really don't want to upload my picture of the Mothman, in case something or someone will get frightened or mad. I have two pictures of the Mothman. Sadly, I don't want to upload it, because they are frightening. There's a picture I found that looks like the Mothman is hanging from a bridge. Some say that Mothman still lives today near the Golden Gate Bridge. Keep a good eye on him if you live. The Mothman only shows up when disasters are about to happen, as he is a sign of warning. If you see Mothman, please contact me. There's no joke you may have heard about a mental institution and the residents yelling something over and over again. So this story may have a familiar sound. But there's nothing funny about what happened to one boy, as narrator Molly Lankford tells us about when he saw the girl in the photograph. 
One school day, a boy named Tom was sitting in class and doing math. It was six more minutes until after school. As he was doing his homework, something caught his eye. His desk was next to the window, and he turned and looked to the grass outside. It looked like a picture. When school was over, he ran to the spot where he saw it. He ran so fast that no one else could grab it. He picked it up and smiled. It had a picture of the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen. She had a dress with tights on and red shoes, and her hand was formed into a peace sign. She was so beautiful he wanted to meet her, so he ran all over school and asked everyone if they knew her or have ever seen her before. But everyone he asked said no. He was devastated. When he was home, he asked his older sister if she knew the girl, but unfortunately she said no. It was very late, so Tom walked up the stairs, placed the picture on his bedside table, and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, Tom was awakened by a tap on his window. It was like a nail tapping. He got scared. After the tapping, he heard a giggle. He saw a shadow near his window, so he got out of his bed, walked towards his window, opened it up, and followed the giggling. By the time he reached it, it was gone. The next day, again, he asked his neighbors if they knew her. Everyone said, sorry, no. When his mother came home, he even asked her if she knew her. She said no. He went to his room, placed the picture on his desk, and fell asleep. Once again, he was awakened by a tapping. He took the picture and followed the giggling. He walked across the road, when suddenly, he got hit by a car. He was dead with the picture in his hand. The driver got out of the car and tried to help him but it was too late. Suddenly he saw the picture and picked it up. He saw a cute girl holding up three fingers. Escape. We look for it all the time. TV, movies, books, podcasts. Not to mention video games. Over the years, there have been plenty of heated debates over the content of games, even creating debates within governments. These particular concerns aren't what narrator Collins Van Gordon is going to tell you about, though. Instead, he's going to tell you about one particular machine from the golden age of arcades. A machine called Polybius. Polybius is an urban legend about a rare arcade game released in 1981. The game was created by a mysterious company called Cinesloschen, German for Sense Deletion, and was a puzzle shoot 'em up game somewhat like Tempest. It was only released in a few suburbs of Portland, Oregon. It was supposedly very popular, with people forming long lines to play it. However, players reported strange things about the game. Things such as hearing a woman crying and seeing grotesque faces out of the corner of their eyes. Players would also have nightmares, experience nausea, headaches, blackouts, or even develop amnesia. Some even committed suicide. Others stopped playing video games altogether, and at least one became an anti-video game activist. According to one owner of an arcade, Men wearing black suits would often come to collect records from the game. They did not take any money, simply data on gameplay. Because of this, the leading theory is that it was some sort of government experiment using subliminal messages. The game remained in obscurity as around one month after its release, all of the cabinets suddenly disappeared. One cabinet did reappear in an arcade in 1998, but it quickly disappeared again. Although some have tried to recreate the game, no one has ever found the original ROM. When people think of Hawaii, it tends to conjure images of sprawling beaches, rolling waves, spam. Maybe that's just the Minnesota in me. If nothing else, tropical paradise. But if you ask the locals about urban legends, they just might tell you about one particular version of a story Nate Dufort is going to tell us. About a place called Morgan's Corner. 
When you think of the island paradise known as Hawaii, what do you think of? Dolphins? Palm trees? Beautiful beaches? Yeah, at least that's what I think of. But if you go to the island of Oahu, go up to any local and ask them about Morgan's Corner, the island that's so beautiful that everyone wants to visit has a dark side. Morgan was about 16 at the time, and he and his girlfriend were going back home after a date in town. They drove and laughed, having a good time, until they reached the middle of the old Pally Road, which, for people who don't know, was one of the few roads that went from their date spot to the town they lived in. Now, I must remind you that Hawaii is a beautiful place filled with nature, but that meant that most places, especially the roads, were surrounded by the wilderness of Hawaii. So when they reached the old road, which is closed to vehicles now, they drove until they reached a slight curve in the woods. When they reached that spot, their car started to sputter and die. They had no choice but to pull over and check it out. When they pulled over, Morgan got out and went out to pull up the hood. He checked everything. The battery was good. He poured in more gas and just got the car oiled. When he got in the car, everything was working. It just wasn't moving. Morgan knew they couldn't wait there all night. Their parents were expecting them, so he devised a plan. Morgan would go out to get help, and his girlfriend would stay there and wait, keeping everything locked until he or someone returned. Morgan got out of his car and waited until his girlfriend locked all the doors. Then he took out a flashlight and started walking in the direction they came, as the town obviously had more cars around than where they were headed. Morgan's girlfriend, who we'll now call Jane, waited for a while. She was obviously scared on the dark road surrounded by wilderness, but she just thought that her boyfriend would be back soon. She waited a long time, and nothing came, until she heard a scraping on the roof of the car. Jane was getting freaked out, but it was probably a mongoose or wild bird, so she just waited until it left. It kept up for some time, though, before actually stopping. And just as it stopped, she heard rain. Drip. 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 Just a soft noise, almost like a drizzling. It was sort of soothing, and she was tired, so she started to doze. In the morning, she was awoken by a police officer knocking on her window. She immediately rolled down her window. The officer asked her if anything was wrong. She replied no, but asked about her boyfriend, Morgan. The officer just looked at her and told her to come out of the car and not look behind her. She obliged and got out. The officer walked her to the police car parked only a few feet off. When they got there, Jane's curiosity got the best of her. She peeked behind the officer and screamed. Above her car was the remains of her boyfriend, feet strung through the tree branch and nails stuck in the roof of the car. Only then did she realize that the soft, soothing raindrops was what was left of Morgan slowly dripping onto her car. Now, if you go to Hawaii and find Morgan's Corner, there's a legend about that place. It goes, if you hug Morgan's tree and look up, you could either see Morgan hanging there, or you could see nothing. If you do this, nothing will happen, unless you get to see Morgan, that is. Then, you will be forever bound to the tree, flesh melting into it. And if you don't believe the story, 
Go to the corner. Hug the tree. Morgan's spirit's always there, waiting for a new visitor. I'm not going to say that I've never felt a little nervous going under a bridge. I've seen Cloverfield. And if I've learned anything from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, it's that under the bridge downtown, I gave my life away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. No, no. Yeah, yeah. And out of fear of being sued, I'm just going to move on right now. I forgot what I was talking about. Bridges, that's right. A little scary on their own, but in the light of day, how scary could they really be? Well, narrator Alicia Atkins is going to tell us exactly how much worse it can get when you see the Bunny Man Bridge. After the Civil War, Fairfax County, Virginia, USA, became more populated, and eventually, an insane asylum was built there. No one wanted to live near the asylum, and because of the public outrage, the institution was then shut down later. The administration transferred the patients in 1904, once the process was completed. During the transfer, some of the patients escaped and hid in the surrounding woods and forestry. These individuals were lost, delusional, and dangerous. Most of them were found, except Marcus Loster and Douglas Griffin. The local authorities found a trail made by the two men. It was littered with half-eaten, mutilated bunnies. The trail led deep into the woods to a tunnel crossing a wide creek. There they found Marcus hanging from the tunnel entrance, with a note attached to his foot. It read, You'll never find me, no matter how hard you try. Signed, The Bunny Man. That tunnel has been called Bunny Man Bridge ever since. The legends say that if you walk all the way down to the tunnel at around midnight, the bunny man will grab and hang you from the entrance of the bridge. Strange deaths and phenomena have constantly been connected with the bunny man bridge. There was a young man from Clifton, Virginia, who came upon the bridge while traveling. Later, he killed his parents and dragged their bodies into the woods to hang them from the bridge, before he killed himself. In 1943, three youths were found dead, hung from the bridge. Their bodies were slashed open, and all had notes attached to their feet all which stated, You'll never catch the bunny man. In 2001, after hearing the tale, six local students and a guide searched the area, only to find mutilated bunny parts during their search. They soon left the forest after they heard noises and caught glimpses of figures in the woods. Some of the scariest stories for me aren't so much the stories that could be true as much as the stories involve places you can visit for yourselves. Narrator Danielle Hewitt is going to tell us about one such place, as she shows us the way to the Devil's Tramping Grounds. In the low, rolling hills of southern Chatham County, south of Siler City, in the woods near Harper's Crossroads, lies one of the most famous haunted places in North Carolina. The Devil's Tramping Ground is a mysterious, perfectly round, and absolutely barren circle, about 40 feet in diameter, in the pine woods of Chatham County. Not a tree, not a flower, no lowly weed, not even a single blade of grass will grow in the limits of the circle. Seed sowed there refuses to sprout. Any vegetation transplanted there will wither and die. And what's even more strange, any object left in the circle before dusk will have been violently moved outside of its bounds by dawn. Dogs tuck their tails in between their legs and whimper when brought near. The frightened animals will dig their heels into the sand, refusing to be brought into the circle. Men have tried to spend the night in the circle, but not one has succeeded and remained sane. Something they see on their vigils drive them out of their wits, never to recover. For the Devil's Tramping Ground 
has earned its name. It's said that this is where the devil himself walks at night. In his tramping ground, the devil spends his nights pacing around and around in a circle and turning his bitter mind toward ways to bring human souls to damnation. It's the scorching heat of his cloven hoofprints that kills the vegetation and has rendered all of the soil barren. He angrily brushes aside anything left in his path, his great strength easily able to toss aside even the heaviest of objects. When he walks in his private spot on earth, the devil drops the illusions with which he disguises himself when he appears to men. In his natural state, the face of this fallen angel is so horrible that no man can see it and remain sane. The mystery of the Devil's Tramping Ground has been known since Chatham County was founded shortly before the War of Independence. From generation to generation, the story has been passed down, and despite efforts by scientists to explain this barren patch of land, no satisfying explanation has ever been given. So if you're driving on State Road 1100 in rural Chatham County at night, and you pass a curve in the road, where there's a narrow path leading off into the woods. When you see a shadowy figure moving between the trees, it's best to drive away as fast as you can and never look back until you're long, long gone. The Devil's Tramping Ground is located about 10 miles south of Siler City on State Road 1100. Devil's Tramping Ground Road. From U.S. 64 south in Siler City, take West Valley Road South. This turns into Siler City Glendon Road. Stay on this for about 10 miles until you reach Harper's Crossroads. At the intersection of Siler City Glendon Road, State Highway 902, and Devil's Tramping Ground Road. The road sign for Devil's Tramping Ground Road may be missing, as it's frequently stolen. But it'll be the first road on your left if you're heading south. Go about a mile down Devil's Tramping Ground Road until you see a pull-off to your right. A well-worn path will take you to the clearing, which is about 20 feet into the woods. The real secret to the circle is, if you put someone's hair within it, then the next day, they will die. Perhaps they die mysteriously in their sleep. Or maybe in a car accident. However, in doing so, you give up your soul to the devil. You ask yourself now, is this true? But the more important question you must ask is, is it worth it? In the lexicon of urban legends and scary tales, there are certain stories that seem to resound louder and hit closer to home than others. Stories we remember from childhood, around campfires, at sleepovers, in movies. Our remaining stories today all hit that mark for me. And I think they just might for you too. First up, Victoria Wan is going to tell us about the sounds of... feet scraping. One night, a couple is traveling on a country road. As they are listening to the radio, a news flash appears announcing that a patient from the local asylum has escaped. The couple becomes filled with fear, so they decide to get to their house as soon as possible. Unfortunately, the car is almost out of gas, so they have to drive under a large oak tree to rest for the night. There's a sound in the bushes, so the guy decides to check it out. Before he leaves, he tells the girl to stay put and that he'll make three knocks on the roof of the car to let her know that it's him. Time passes, and the girl becomes worried. But soon she hears three knocks and becomes relieved, but the knocking continues. She becomes terrified and crawls to the back seat and stays there until morning. She wakes up to see the police opening the door. They guide her out and walk her away from the car, warning her not to look behind her. She cannot restrain her curiosity and looks behind before falling to the ground crying. Her boyfriend is hanging from the tree, slashed from his neck to his groin. The continuous knocking was caused by his feet, tapping the roof of the car. The 
That last story may sound familiar in a way you can't quite place. You may have heard it slightly different and you can't quite figure it out. Perhaps you're thinking about a story our own producer Steve Blizzon is going to tell. It may be one of the most classic and famous stories of all. The story of The Hook Man. A teenage boy drove his date to a dark and deserted lover's lane for a makeout session. He turned on the radio for mood music, leaned over to whisper in the girl's ear, and began kissing her. Minutes later, the mood was broken when the music suddenly stopped mid-song. After a moment of silence, an announcer's voice came on, warning in an ominous tone that a convicted murderer had just escaped from the state insane asylum, which happened to be located within a half mile of Lover's Lane, and urging that anyone who notices a man wearing a stainless steel hook in place of his missing right hand should immediately report his whereabouts to the police. The girl became frightened and asked to be taken home. The boy, feeling bold, locked all the doors instead, and assuring his date that they would be safe, attempted to kiss her again. She became frantic and pushed him away, insisting that they leave. Relenting, the boy peevishly jerked the car into gear, and spun its wheels as he pulled out of the parking space. When they arrived at the girl's house, she got out of the car, and reaching to close the door, began to scream uncontrollably. The boy ran to her side to see what was wrong, and there, dangling from the door handle, was a bloody hook. And finally, many of us can think of a time when we drove late at night, all alone on a long stretch of road, trying to stay awake or alert despite the droning of tires and our feet and a few feet of illumination from the headlights. Driving alone can be difficult and boring, but as narrator Heather Thomas is going to tell us, driving alone is probably more preferable than the scenario of the man in the back seat. One night, a woman went out for drinks with her girlfriends. She left the bar fairly late at night, got in her car, and onto the deserted highway. After a few minutes, she noticed a lone pair of headlights in her rearview mirror, approaching at a pace just slightly quicker than hers. As the car pulled up behind her, she glanced and saw the turn signal on. The car was going to pass, when suddenly it swerved back behind her, pulled up dangerously close to her tailgate, and the brights flashed. Now she was getting nervous. The lights dimmed for a moment, and then the brights came back on, and the car behind her surged forward. The frightened woman struggled to keep her eyes on the road and fought the urge to look at the car behind her. Finally, her exit approached, but the car continued to follow, flashing the brights periodically. Through every stoplight and turn, it followed her until she pulled into her driveway. She figured her only hope was to make a mad dash into the house and call the police. As she flew from the car, so did the driver of the car behind her, and he screamed, Lock the door and call the police. Call 911. When the police arrived, the horrible truth was finally revealed to the woman. The man in the car had been trying to save her. As he pulled up behind her and his headlights illuminated her car, he saw the silhouette of a man with a butcher knife rising from the back seat to stab her. So he flashed his brights and the figure crouched back down. The moral of the story? Always check the back seat.
And that wraps it up for this series on urban legends. And I know there are more out there. We've been getting emails since part one on other stories. If you have your own stories that you love from around the campfire and want to hear it told on this podcast around our own little fire, please feel free to contact us on social media or at creepypod at gmail.com. When possible, we prefer links, especially if your story is a different version of one that was already told on the show. I hope you've enjoyed the stories these last few weeks. We'll do it again, sooner this time. Until next week, stay creepy. For more information, including pictures and videos of the stories told on this podcast, or to suggest stories for future episodes, please visit us at CreepyPod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or email us at CreepyPod at gmail.com. All stories told on this podcast can be found at creepypastawikia.com and are protected by a Creative Commons license. Some rights reserved unless otherwise stated.